Hey everybody, and welcome to FYB's live Q&A webcast. Will Hamilton alongside Adam Siminski. Hello. And uh, this webcast is very similar if you guys have been watching the, uh, the, French, or the French Open, the Wimbledon webcast uh, as well. Yeah. Um, but this is where we simply take instructional questions, technique, strategy, uh, whatever you guys want to talk about. Uh, and it's exactly the same as something we do every single week in F Premium, which is just a Q&A webcast. Um, where we take uh, pre-submitted questions, questions in the, in the chat right now, mm -hmm. um, and we answer them. Um, and, uh, you know, a lot of people had asked questions about it, so we wanted to just do one so you guys could get a sense of, uh, of what, what, we do in premium. Yeah, what we do in premium and how Absolutely. this feature is going to help you guys out. And we, um, got, we have a bunch of questions emailed to us ahead of time already, but if you have questions for us and you're mm -hmm. watching live and you're in the chat, go ahead and put your questions in the chat. I from Verdascu, so I've added Verdascu your question to the you know to the bottom of our list mm -hmm. here. And uh, if, if we answer a question, if I we have these these canned questions now, if I answer one and you have a follow up, post it then, right. um, and we can you know get a dialogue going because that's the whole point of this right. thing is a conversation versus sort of the more you know one way discussion when it's just a, a, a recorded video that's not live. Right. Um, so. Um, so Gene, Gene immediately asked me a question about Murray uh, versus uh, closed roof. We'll, we'll talk about that, or we can talk about that offline. Right now, we're just going to purely take your instructional content or yeah. instructional questions. Again, this is what we do in premium. And we'll talk about, uh, if you guys have some questions about FYB premium, we can clip over to it uh, in a minute and uh, show you some of the stuff that's in there. Okay. Uh, as well. Well, let's get to the first question that's been emailed to us. Uh, we actually have two questions that are pretty similar, um, and they're both about moon ballers. Um, and the first question is, I've played a moon baller before, and I didn't find myself attacking, but rather having a moon ball rally back and forth with this guy. Since he's pretty much a pusher, I did not want to make any mistakes, but I couldn't find myself aggressive at the same time. How do I beat moon ballers like this? And then the second question, which is pretty similar, is, I am normally a very aggressive player and I dictate points, but it's extremely hard playing my friend who is similar to Murray and literally tracks everything down, gets a lot of balls back by hitting moon balls. Uh, should I take those moon balls and handle them as drive volleys and end the point or what? Yeah, I mean, this, this is a very uh, common situation for players who aren't at the level where they can just take a huge cut at the ball and kind of get that instant offense. Mm -hmm. um, moon ballers and pushers are effective up to a point. And then once you get a player who can, you know, really put some pace on the ball, then it's, it's real easy to beat them. But if you're not... Or, or who has the ability to execute a strategy and, and put the ball where he wants to, to some degree. Sure. Well, yeah, yeah, uh, uh, of course. But the, 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 the trick here, and we'll go over and diagram this on the race board, is if you're not at that point yet when you can just take that moon ball and do a lot with it, what do you, uh, what do, you do um, with this type of player? And what we're going to do is go over to the dry erase board. And, um, you know, this video is going to take, or this, this answer is going to assume you have watched our strategy mini-series. We talked about inside and outside ground strokes. Having that foundation and understanding those concepts, incredibly important when you're trying to construct a strategy to beat a moon baller or beat a pusher. Now, the reason these guys are moon balling you is, or pushing, is because their technique is not, you know, fundamentally sound. They have to kind of, I mean, they're called pushers because they literally push the ball into the court and their only strategy is to keep it in. Now, what that means is their ability to directionally control the ball or do a lot with it is very much diminished. So you're going to get most of the tennis balls landing somewhere in this area when you're playing a moon baller or a pusher. They obviously can't aim for the corner because they don't have the control to pull that off. So most balls go in this area of the court, and that's sufficient to beat players or give players who can't really control with their groundies a, uh, a lot of trouble. So what's the, uh, what strategy should we use to combat this type of opponent? Well, let's say we've got a backhand rally going on right now between these two. And remember, these, this is going to be an outside ground stroke rally. And you're going to get, we'll put Moon Baller up here, call him Mr. Moon or Mr. Moon Baller. And he's going to be sending you Moon Balls cross court. And we'll say they land about here. 
And right now you'd be taking an outside backhand if your right hand encircles the player's stick, the side they're hitting on, so that'd be an outside uh, backhand. And this is the lower percentage shot. Remember, the inside ground strokes are the ones we prefer. Those balls, easier to control. We can do a little bit more with them because we have more leverage over those balls. So if you know this guy is going to be sending these balls, if he's hitting over here, most of these balls are going to be coming in this area of the court. And you basically want to assume that shots over here, extremely unlikely. So you can essentially give that part of the court away. Don't even worry about that. And I would actually recommend, you know, the, the second part of our strategy series said you recover over here when your opponent is on this end of the court. Well, I would advocate just cheating over and standing in this area of the court and turning a lot of these into inside forehands. So instead of hitting backhands, you go forehand. So first of all, you're going to have a strength to presumably a weakness or a weaker side. Typically at the rec level, the backhand is the weaker side. So you'll probably be hitting your favorite shot to your opponent's weaker side. Now the trick here, again, you got this inside ground stroke, so you should be able to hit sufficiently, you, know, you should be able to hit just fine, not make a lot of errors going cross court. And the goal here is to be patient, keep going cross court until you get maybe a little bit of a short ball, not necessarily you know, an obvious short something where you feel comfortable taking this ball down the line. And when you do that, you're going to get this guy on the run. This doesn't need to be a winner. This is just sort of your test in the guy. You're going to put it over here. And what you're looking for is that real short ball, something in this area of the court. And if he doesn't hit this, let's say you hit it over here and he gets it back deep, you can't do anything with it, well, then you just rinse and repeat. There's no, the key here, do not rush with a moon ball or a pusher. They can't hurt you. So there's no reason to take a mediocre opportunity and really try and blast it. So when you get that short ball, that real short ball, where you can move in, well, this is a situation where you need to make a decision on where to go with the tennis ball. If this guy's over here, then it might make some sense to go over here. Typically, with a pusher or a moon baller, they stand pretty far behind the baseline. There's a decent amount of distance here. So I would advocate with these shorter balls, that's going to open up angles. So if you can pull these balls off the court in either direction, then, you're, then the pusher is going to be really far off the court when he gets to one of these balls. He's going to be in the bleachers. And if you are positioned correctly for the next volley, then you don't have to do too much with it, and you can just kind of push it into the open court. You can hit a mediocre overhead. But this is sort of a high percentage play. You're not required to do a lot here in terms of shot making. You hang out on this area of the court. You can send a lot of balls over here. So it's outside. Let's sort of recap this. It's outside ground strokes. Lower percentage shot for the moon baller, so the down the line, extremely unlikely. And if he starts going for this, you actually want that because that's going to lead to errors. So by giving away some area over here, you might actually goad him into trying that shot. And that's good for you. That's going to give you short balls. That's going to lead to errors. So you're standing over here. The guy's giving you a lot of inside ground strokes, high percentage balls for you. And you can send it cross court, maybe look for an opportunity to go down the line and then see what he does with it. But the goal here is to play percentage tennis, give yourself the high percentage shots, look for the shorter ball, and then you can open up the court with an angle. You can hit deep if you want to, but it's a, it's, I'm going to diagram this. It's, you know, a shot at the baseline, followed by a high percentage shot, followed by a high percentage ball when you move into the court, followed by getting yourself close to net where you can end the point. And sometimes it won't make it up here. Sometimes, you know, you'll, the, the pusher will make an error. But that's the progression you want to follow, but you want to do it in a high percentage way. Now, there's another question, Adam, related to this. So I'm going to leave this diagram up here, and we can get to it. Unless, does anybody okay. in the chat have a... Uh, well, I wanted to follow up with a sort of similar question. Okay. Um, and then, you know, yeah, because I organized the questions, too, to mm -hmm. uh, sure. be relevant in terms of the Yeah, next. we had a question from Verdascu in chat, which, okay. it, which was sort of related. Not a moonballer question, per se, but uh, Verdascu's question was... Uh, what is the best tactic to use against players who feed you balls without any pace? Uh, you know, so in other words, 
a lot of times you feed off of your opponent's pace, or you know the two of you can establish yeah. a rally that is centered around a, a ball with some decent pace. Uh -huh. But what do you do if, sort of like a moon ball, your opponent just kind of pushes the ball back to you, doesn't really put anything on it, and you have to generate your own pace? What's the best tactic for dealing with that? Yeah, I mean, I think it was um, Howard Brody in The Physics of Tennis uh, says that 25% um, of your pace is from your opponent's shot. <laughs> so if he's not giving you any pace, then obviously you're not going to be able to hit as hard. Uh, you know, the, the goal is to, is to make sure you're playing within yourself. If you're swinging a little bit harder than you normally would to try right. and ramp up the pace, that's not a good idea. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I would keep the technique uh, fundamentally sound, and I would keep the ball deep. Yeah. But I wouldn't be looking to, to try and swing harder to, uh, to add pace. Now, I can, let's, get, let's keep this question in mind okay. um, and then jump to the one before because this is going to explain, well, you'll, you'll see what I mean when I uh, when And you want to go to this question from Phil? From Phil, exactly. Okay. Uh, um, yes. Or wait, that's not the one I wanted. Maybe it is. Um, well, there was... Uh there were these oh, two should questions. I take it as a drive volley? Okay. Right. Um, actually, why don't we why don't we actually just address um, Andrew? The should I take it as a volley? Sure. And then we'll talk about uh, Verdascu. Okay. Um, let's go back to uh, the dry race board. So the question that we're answering here again is, you know, with those moon balls, do you come to net and do you try to end those points with drive volleys? Take those moon balls, drive volley them deep, and end the point. And then what's Verdascu's? This well, Verdascu's question was, you know, about about hitting with uh, no pace or your opponent hitting. Yeah, with no exactly. Pace. So how do we get pace on on the ground stroke? The reason the reason I want to have Verdascu in mind is because uh, Andrew was asking sort of how do I end points against um, um, pushers mm -hmm. and you know or, or people that hit moon balls. So we're gonna we're gonna talk about how to how to be aggressive, but in a high percentage manner. So you're not getting you know the moon baller. Let's say you get the short ball in here but there's no pace on it. And a really big problem a lot of rec players have is they overhit. They, they get that ball there, that short ball, and then they try and do a lot with it, and they end up making an error. Now the goal here is to um, you know, hit, uh, like we said before, you don't wanna take a massive cut, a cut that you, uh, you know, you're know you not accustomed to taking, but how do we get pace on the tennis ball? Well, one of the tricks you can do to uh, to get some pace is to space yourself properly. Um, and what that means is, you know, the ball, your contact point is going to be here. How do you space yourself relative to the ball? And what you want to have happen is you want to be moving forward through the ball using your body's momentum so that you can take a, a, a solid swing, but it's not this huge, massive cut. But your body's momentum is going to add a little bit more juice to the tennis ball. So the trick is to get that short ball and then I'm going to stand back from where my contact point is going to be so that, you know, if I have a moment to pause, so that I can close and hit through it at the appropriate time. So if I was going to diagram that, let's say, let me get rid of all of this stuff. Ian Westerman of EssentialTennis.com has just joined us in the chat. What's up, Ian? <laughs> so let's say we've got a short ball right here. And I would normally be right here when I'm hitting it. So in other words, I'm just going to put a little X at where I would be standing if I was going to hit this ball. Now, if I have a little bit of time, and you will against a moon baller, well, I might want to not necessarily immediately close and, and park myself right there. I might hang out a step or two back so that I can gather myself and then be moving forward through the shot as I hit. And if you take a nice, you know, smooth swing at the ball, it doesn't have to be anything too crazy. You can use fundamentally sound mechanics. Well, you know, with a horizontal swing path, that is going to, uh, that's going to give you a little bit of extra pace. But again, you're not taking these massive cuts. Mm -hmm. you're, you're swinging within yourself. Right. Um, and uh, that's going to lead to, a, first of all, you know, a high percentage play, consistent mm -hmm. play, but aggressive play. Now, I think also one of the things that is doubly frustrating, and we've talked about this before in our premium webcasts because we've gotten similar questions, a lot of time what's doubly frustrating for players when they're playing those moon balls, those high balls mm -hmm. that sit up real short, and you feel like, man, why can't I just put this ball away? 
and you overplay the ball, and then you either dump it in the net or you hit it long, you hit it wide. Mm -hmm. You make an error on a ball that you feel like you know is an easy ball to handle. Yeah, and that's and that's mentally doubly frustrating. Uh, you know, do you have any? tips on how to deal with that, how to stay, you know, how to keep yourself motivated even if you're missing easy balls like that. Well, there's the old there's the uh, the tactic we've talked about before which is called shrinking the court. If you're a little loose, what happens? Make another trip over to the back over to the dry board. erase board. Yeah, if you're if you're a little loose and we can leave these Actually, this is uh well you've got all, you know, if you're a little loose and you're missing a little bit wide, you can just sort of visually you know, visually, mentally, whatever, pull the cord in a little bit. So the sidelines get drawn in. And this is a technique called shrinking the cord? Shrinking the cord. This is shrinking the cord, uh, taught to me by Frank Salazar, who I believe Dennis, by the way, Adam, Dennis Kudlow, Frank's one of, the, one of Frank's kids, yeah. is in the quarters of Junior Wimbledon. Hmm. Nice. Um, so congratulations to him. He's one of the best coaches in the United States. But the, the advantage of this tactic is, you know, a lot of people get frustrated and then they, with, with their shots they're missing, then they turn into pushers. They just roll the ball down the middle of the court here. That's not a strategy. That's just getting the ball in. So by shrinking the court, let's say three feet, you know, it, 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 it'll vary depending on how kind of off you are. But by doing this, you still are implementing a strategy. You're still saying, I'm going to go cross court backhand to backhand until I get an inside ground stroke, then I'm going to go down the line. But instead of maybe aiming you know, here with the down the line, you might aim here. So you're just being more conservative by pulling the, uh, the target in a little bit. And uh, that is a way to, you know, I think it was Paul, in, in Paul Wardlaw's book, Pressure Tennis, this is not his quote, he quotes someone else, but he says confidence is simply getting the ball in. Sure. So this is getting the ball in, this is building confidence but around a strategy. Okay. Because, you know, I would agree with that quote, but getting the ball in, if you're just sort of like, you know, pushing it, if that doesn't make you it, feel very doesn't good. doesn't make you confident. Yeah. Right. Yeah, you don't, feel, you don't feel good. So you want to be executing a strategy that you know is going to be successful, but you want to be doing it in a way that allows you to play high percentage and, and allows you to not get too frustrated with yourself yeah, making absolutely. simple mistakes. Yeah, you want to, exactly, you want to play your game but maybe just make small tweaks if, you know, the, the pinpoint accuracy isn't quite there. All right. So I think um, the next one was from Phil. This was yeah, the next bit. question from Phil um, is, uh, when you're taking a ball that comes over shoulder level, should you hit with more topspin? Um, this is entirely sort of context-oriented. Um, mm -hmm. When, uh, if I get a uh, shoulder level ball and I'm up at net, I might hit a classic forehand. If, um, if I'm back at the baseline, I might hit, and I'm set up, I might hit a windshield wiper forehand. Mm -hmm. If I'm retreating, I might hit a reverse forehand. So, you know, these, this is sort of a good opportunity, first time, to clip over to the computer screen and look it up. Okay. This is what FYB Premium actually looks like. It just looks like FYB except red background. We're trying it's to, a red color. We're, trying to, we're, trying, to, we're <laughs> trying to be edgy, right? Yeah. So if you go over to block one, we divide everything into blocks. Blocks are like chapters in FYB yeah. Premium. So here would be the forehand fundamentals, progressions, common errors. And this is what I would refer to as, let me open up the magnifier, um, as a, a classic forehand where you have that over the shoulder finish. Okay. So this would be maybe appropriate for a, a shoulder high ball that is uh, where you're up at net, where you maybe don't need as much topspin and you really want to drive through the tennis ball. Okay. Um, if I was further back, then you can you can pull it back to actually go this, back yeah when you go back sure this gives us um I'm gonna you can see these are the blocks right here that gives you a better view um, but if you if you have a ball back at the baseline you want a little bit more topspin then you might use the windshield wiper which is right here so use that that you know that'll give you more topspin if you're retreating okay then you might use the reverse because all these Reverse and the windshield wiper allow you to do the same thing, but they uh, they allow you to hit the same type of ball. But they um, you can bring it back to us. Sure. But they but some of sometimes you're not able to execute everything from a technical standpoint based on how you're moving, your momentum, how your foot your your foot <laughs> your feet are set up. So if you're kind of out of position, the reverse forehand becomes more appropriate. Um, so I would so you want to you want to you know. 
all we just talked about, the, the classic forehand, the reverse forehand, the uh, windshield wiper, all of that is about making your uh, forehand dynamic. Mm -hmm. In other words, you want to be able to alter your swing path at will. So if I have a high ball at net, I want to swing through it, mm -hmm. flatten it out. If I need more topspin, I can swing up on it a little bit more. If right. I'm out of position and my momentum's carrying me in you know, the wrong direction, right. how do I still hit a solid forehand? Well, it'd be the reverse forehand, the thing right. you see Rafa hit all the time. And in, in FYB Premium, we spend a lot of time talking about how your strategy as a player develops alongside or develops with your ability to execute the so basically, one of the big things about the way you ride strategy in premium, your strategy evolves as your forehand becomes more and more dynamic. I think that's a somewhat kind of 30,000 foot view of, of what we're saying. But uh, as you learn to master these new shots, your strategic development you know, can yeah. increase as well. Yep. Um, and what else? You want to well, go to think, the next question? Yeah, I think we're good on that. So um, Okay. Um, the next question then is going to be from Tom, and it is, I was playing some great rec tennis today, and I got a very high percentage of my flat serves in, but even though I won my points a lot of the time due to your great instructional videos, I Thank might you. add, <laughs> my opponent said that, if I that I would have gotten a lot of aces if I could have put my serves, both first and second, mm -hmm. into the corners. So I was wondering if you had any advice on how do you improve the accuracy of the server? How do you place it where you want? Yeah, well, there's a, there's a, there's a drill. I'm going to go diagram it on the dry erase board first. Um, I, I will, I'll say ahead of time, though, that at the rec level and even in, at college, um, going for aces is, that's one of the things you see the pros do, and you're like, oh, man, that's awesome. I yeah. really want to hit aces <laughs> and hit winners. That's the, the, the pro game is not everybody else's game um the the game played at, at college outside of you know national championship level high yeah. really really high level right certainly at the rec level is percentages um my view on the serve is that you should place it well but you shouldn't be going for aces it should set up a point right for there you. are there are some rules that you can live by when serving in terms of the, both the type of serve that you hit mm -hmm. and where you place your serve both first and second serve that can actually really help you start off a point exactly on the mm -hmm. right footing yep um, and that's a huge part of strategy as well yeah that's one of the things we we talk about and in, in premium is you know where do you set up your serve to or put your serve to allow you to construct strategy um, so I'm going to dump all of this stuff and I'm just quickly going to give you a pretty simple drill uh, you can do and then we're going to actually clip over to some video of me doing it. I like that Mr. Moonballer, by the way. Yeah, we Mr. definitely Moonballer's ought to keep that around for future. Not uh, bad. <laughs> um, all right. So you're serving right here, over here. So the trick to learning directional control is simply to set up targets. They can be cones. They can be, uh, you know, some tennis balls, whatever. I typically set up three targets down the middle, in the, uh, down the uh, T, middle, and out wide. And you hit a couple serves at this target, then you hit a couple serves at this target, and you hit a couple serves at this target. And then, you know, the, the, what that allows you to do is you lock this one down, and then you go to the middle one, and you see if you can make slight adjustments to get this target down, and then you send it over here and aim for that target. It's really not any more complicated than that. You just set up targets, you hit a lot of serves, and you, uh, you, uh, you know, develop the rhythm um, and you kind of hone that technique. Now, I do want to say a couple points. Uh, let me reload this video. Um, so this, all right, we're going to pause it, but now we... we oh, okay, uh, let's, yeah. uh, let's clip So this is, this is now a video of me doing this exact drill. No, that's the whiteboard. That is not the computer screen. There we so go. we've got it frozen right now. Now, before we play this, um, when you're doing this drill, you don't want, you're not trying to hit as hard as you can. Okay. You're trying to practice your technique. You're maybe hitting, you know, 50 to 75% speed. So we'll play it right now. And this, this so is, this is pretty raw footage. This and is, now is the, this is inside of premium. This is inside of premium. Yeah. Now this is we just went to the court and we just basically set the camera running. There's no editing here, really. There's yeah. There's no we yeah. This is an unedited video. There's no cuts. And you'll notice I'm not trying to hit very hard. I'm very relaxed, just making sure my, I'm, I'm placing the serve properly. 
not too much leg kick, for example. And you're aiming down the tee. I'm here. aiming down the tee right now. And so I go, you know, I don't know how many serves that is, seven maybe, something like that, just right down the tee. Yep. And um, I'm only aiming for the target. Again, not, not like if you could, uh, you know, down the tee, if you can place it well with a moderate uh, speed and consistency, you're going to be just fine. Um, Do you think so, a lot of rec players go for too much on their first serve? Um, absolutely. I mean, the problem, the problem is that, you know, I, as I love. It's a good toss. Every, thanks. You know, <laughs> you, you, you know, you got to make adjustments. And now you're aiming down the middle. Now I'm going to aim down the middle, yeah. So the, the, the trick here is to, um, you know, we get enamored by watching the pros, and we say, man, we got to hit as hard as we can. Sure. Well, at the rec level, high percentage first serves is more important. Um, well, it's, you, we, why don't we just play the whole thing? You, don't, you want to clip yeah, back? Yeah, why, why don't we watch the whole thing? Just, sure. Um, so I haven't stopped it yet. It'll come back in a second. And uh, we'll go out wide. I mean, what I, what I want to uh, emphasize here by just watching the whole thing is that there's no cuts, and you just need to develop this to the point. So I just dump one in the net where, uh, you know, you can just do this. Um, of course, we're, we're pulling this video in from another computer, so it's a little bit jerky, uh, you know, which is why the playback is not quite smooth. But yeah, so um, yeah, this video is on YouTube. This one, you know, is easily you know is pulled into uh, uh, premium as well. Um, and now you're aiming out wide. It looks like now I'm going out wide. And uh, oh, it's good. Yeah, Ian in the chat, um, um, yeah, is, is echoing. Uh, if you guys haven't been to EssentialTennis.com, definitely check that web website out. But what he says is, it's nice to hear. Um, um, that yeah, you know, it's it's good that pros should. Uh, I'm, I'm <laughs> having good. trouble reading. I'm gonna let Adam do this. I'm gonna take a drink of water because I'm the wow, one. Who, I'm was, the one who reads around here. That if you was, haven't noticed um, that was you know, through all these webcasts that having passed the third grade, <laughs> uh, I do the reading around here. Uh, the tennis coaching is is your deal. Um, <laughs> My head hurts now. I was trying to read. It's too much. It's too much. Um, Okay, well, uh, you want to move on to the next question that's been emailed to us ahead of time. By the way, that you guys are, you know, you're putting questions in the chat. We are getting those. I have a list of, I, be, I believe, uh, five or so questions, you know, that, that are, have come into the chat that are good ones that I've added to the list yeah. of things. We'll J Jayco just asked, how can you keep yourself from going for too much on short balls? Uh, we answered that like 10 minutes ago. We did. So um, if you missed that part, uh, just re recording this right now. It'll be on YouTube later. So we'll put it on the Internet. Um, afterwards. Okay, uh, well then let's move on to the next question, um, which comes from Dave. It says, what are the things that great serve returners possess, and how can I get those? I want to really make my return a weapon, so how do you go about okay. doing that? Got my handy dandy note card. Um, there's, a couple, there's a couple things, there's no uh, particular order, um, and you know, we'll, we'll talk about this in the context of, of Andre Agassi. Uh, who is the greatest returner, in my opinion, mm -hmm. uh, ever. Jimmy Connors, another good guy. Um, the first is an abbreviated backswing. Okay. Um, just very short mechanics racket. is back, huge backswing. And then, uh, you know, uh, uh, that'll prevent you from being late. And you'll be able to keep the, uh, you know, your contact point out in front of you, especially with, uh, with bigger returners, um, or bigger servers, excuse me. Uh, the second is a, uh, a is a linear swing path, and this is not necessarily you don't necessarily have to have a linear swing path uh, to be a good returner. Leighton Hewitt has a more vertical swing path on mm -hmm. the forehand, but if you're trying to be aggressive, what you want is the racket to be moving forward through the ball and not up. Because if it's moving very vertically, that makes it even harder to time. It makes it harder to time exactly. The strings are only sort of on the window of the tennis ball when the racket's going like this, a shorter amount of time than versus, you know, straight through it. Right. Where you might have a little bit more margin for error. Mm -hmm. Somebody like Andre Agassi or Connors, very linear swing paths. They swing through the ball, the classic forehand mm -hmm. where it finishes up over the shoulder. Worth noting that Leighton Hewitt has a two-handed backhand, so he comes through it on the backhand side right. uh, a little bit more. Mm -hmm. um, to contrast that, you have someone like Rafael Nadal, who is a better returner on the backhand side than the forehand, and the but forehand sometimes struggles because he swings up so much. Yeah, I was going to say, his swing path is so vertical. It must be extremely difficult, particularly against big servers, um, you know, for him to accurately time his return. Yeah, it's, um, yeah, exactly. So the heart of the server, you know, if you're swinging up a lot, trying to put a lot of spin on the ball, that's going to uh, make it hard to, to time the ball. Mm -hmm. um, next thing is uh, footwork. 
Uh, your footwork needs to be very precise, uh, especially if you're cutting the ball off. Uh, let me sure. just quickly demo what that looks like. If you're, we'll put you up here. If you're trying to return standing on the baseline or maybe a couple steps back and you're moving in to cut the ball off, there, you only get a couple steps. So you need to be very precise and efficient with your footwork. If you are stand a little bit further back, this is something Hewitt does, then it becomes more, uh, I wouldn't say relaxed, but you have a little bit more flexibility in terms of the footwork you use. It's more similar to ground, you know, a typical ground stroke rally. But when you're up here, it's very, very controlled. You gotta be very precise. Um, the key with um, this tactic or standing back is timing your split step. Can't time the split step wrong or if you are, are, are timing the split step wrong, you're gonna be in a world of hurt because you're not gonna be explosive to the ball and a hard hit serve is gonna be by you before you can really react effectively. All right. Um, not, you know, one not, other thing that, that I wanna add in there about returning serve is that virtually no one that I know at the rec level actually regularly practices their return. Yeah. I mean, think about the last time that you took an on-court lesson. I'm guessing you worked on your serve, your forehand, and your backhand, maybe Maybe your volleys. Did you work on returning serve? Probably not. Probably not, yeah. Um, You know, but the interesting thing is that you're returning serve half the time you're playing tennis, but no one practices that first shot. And so I think that just in general, by practicing that footwork, practicing cutting the ball off, shortening up your backswing, Absolutely. And, you know, actually working on those things on court, you're actually going to give yourself a pretty big advantage over most other rec players. Guys, who, yeah, guys, I'm going to, I'm, I'm, I'm signing off. I'm just going to let Adam, yeah, Adam, Adam's, Adam's on point on this stuff now. I'm going to. Adam, the tennis coach. I'm, I'm teleporting <laughs> out or something. Um, yeah, okay. I, got, I got two, no, absolutely right. Um, the, the first ball, the serve and the return, if you are, you know, on point with both of those, and again, like Adam said, absolutely correct. If, you know, you work on the return, you're going to have a leg up. Mm-hmm. on a lot of other rec players. Two more uh, points real quick. Uh, um, real good returners have good timing. Mm-hmm. Um, and that is, uh, that is something that takes, uh, takes time to develop. Mm-hmm. Uh, I would recommend having your buddy um, hit serves to you, but he should do it from the service line. So he's much closer to you than normal. And the pros use this drill all the time. They'll have somebody stand at the service line um, hitting, uh, you know, hitting serves so the pace is a little bit higher um, and then the, the last would be uh, um, their good returners are able to make adjustments if you're trying to cut the ball off and that's not working then you might need to take a couple steps back and you can you should be able to do that in match um, and that obviously doesn't just apply to the returner it applies to you know just being a good strategic player in general mm-hmm. um, and the final is uh, at least on the pro level would be able to read serves uh, at the rec level you know there's there's your standard flat serve toss, which you'll figure out after watching your opponent hit a couple uh, uh, first serves, and mm-hmm. then a kick serve is gonna or topspin is gonna drift further over your head typically. So if you're cognizant of that, then you can kind of tell what serves coming, and you can prepare yourself a little bit better. Okay, actually, since you mentioned you know reading the serve, and we're talking about serves and returns here, I want to go to another question that we got during the chat here, um, and that was from uh, Jacob Tennis MB. And his question is, can you use uh, a kick serve or a slice serve on your first serve? And is that effective? Uh, can you use a kick or a slice on your first serve? Absolutely. Absolutely. The pros use uh, slice serves in particular all the time. Some, Sampras actually kind of had a hybrid flat kick serve mm-hmm. um, where he would, he would go after it, but it had a lot of spin on it. So he had a very high first serve percentage because the ball would get pulled into the court. Right. Um, at the rec level, I think it's a great to have a little bit of spin, maybe you know uh, some sort of kick in there, right? Um, where you're still being aggressive, but the serve is going to pull the, uh, the excuse me, the spin is going to pull the ball into the court, give you that high percentage serve, um, you know, and uh, yeah. yeah, I think you know you want ideally as a rec player, you want to develop your toolbox, and you, you want to have that toolbox full of different tools that you can use to beat your opponents. You want to have a flat serve, you want to have a kick serve, and a slice serve is nice. You want to be able to vary those things up. You want to be able to throw some variety at your opponent, and you want to have all of those tools so that you can serve the most effectively. And for you, you know, 
a lot of rec players just think, okay, first serve means flat serve, second serve means some kind of kick yeah. serve, or it means I hit my first serve but softer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, um, you know, if you find what works for you, if you, for instance, you hit a great kick serve but you have trouble hitting a flat serve in, use the kick serve more often. It's yeah. a lot about percentages. You want to get that point started. There's no need to double fault or to get behind in points, you know, because you're having to powder puff your second serve in. Find a first serve that works for you that allows you to start points on offense and then use that serve. Yeah. Uh, because percentages, percentage plays are huge, uh, even at the rec level. Couldn't say it any better myself. Um, okay, so do we want to go to the next question? Sure. Then? Okay. Um, the next question Easy. is from Nick. I think it's a VIP, actually, a question about dubs. Ah, okay, a question about doubles. You're right, I, I skipped over one from VIP. Uh, apparently, he's an important person. Yeah, VIP. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, at the net, if your partner hits a floater or tends to have weak ground strokes or serves, and your opponent is poaching those weak balls uh, and volleying them right at you, should you move back or should you stand your ground uh, You know, and just get faster reflexes, basically? I'm a beginner at doubles, and so far I've been hit a lot, and I tend to That's turn around good. to avoid getting hit in yeah, the face. Yeah, you, you basically want to you want to move back to the baseline. Um, let me just quickly. Whoa. Almost. Don't die on me. Almost kicked out our internet connection. Uh, so the the formation is called two back. This would be your uh, your normal <laughs> traditional. We have a question in chat that I have to interject here. Okay. Uh, my college roommate Sean is asking me huh. a question, and it is. How will I feel after he crushes me in straight sets this weekend? <laughs> well, we should bring out the video cameras and film it. We should. We should bring out the video cameras. All right, all right, back to the all whiteboard. Right. <laughs> um, so this is your standard doubles formation. Um, and if, uh, oh, excuse me, I'm sorry, it's, it's returning. Uh, so you're getting served to. And then weak return, um, we need more icons. So we'll say, uh, we'll say server here who's going to be closing after he serves, and then the net man. And the return, doesn't matter what side, we'll say is a little bit weak and is getting poached right at the net man, and he's getting killed. Um, the, yeah, so what you want to do in this situation is a formation called two back, where you both just start back at the baseline like this. And you'll see this at the pro level, college level, should see it at the rec level. Basically, if someone is struggling with returns, then the net guy needs to move back to avoid this situation. And if the guy is, you know, if the net man is poaching a lot and putting the ball in spot, you know, and, and really taking advantage, then you need this guy to be back to cover all the various shots he can hit and certainly, you know, not get himself pegged. So by moving back, you're going to have a better chance at, uh, at returning, or at least not returning, handling uh, the poaches of your, uh, you know, your opponent. Mm -hmm. All right, we will go to the uh, the next question then. Um, and D tennis asked question: Is I formation better than two back? I formation is a serving formation. Yeah, versus you don't a see, returning formation. Yeah, you don't see people in the I formation returning serve. You don't see them in the I formation in the middle of a rally. That's just how you start off when you are serving. When your team is serving, you can use an I formation, and it and the I formation is particularly useful to prevent your opponent from knowing whether or not you're going to poach. They don't know which direction you're going to go. Yeah, you're move one it makes way, it, yeah. it makes it a lot. They don't know which direction the net man is going to go. It makes it a lot harder to decide where they're going to try to put their return, whether mm -hmm. they're going to go cross court with it or down the line. Um, but of course, if you use an I formation, you need to agree with the net man if you're the server which way each of you'll you is going. You'll signal. You're, you, you know, you'll, you'll right. develop some sort of signal system. We had one when I played in college, just, you know, tell a guy which way you're going to go, just hand behind your back. Quick question from Hello Happy Kid. Uh, uh, what's the point of the slice? Is it neutralizing? It can't. Um, you or can it can it. be used to set up offensive Exactly. Rallies. You can use it to set up offensive situations. You can use it as an approach shot because the slice stays lower than a topspin ground stroke. Um, so you can force big guys to bend down. Some people just don't handle slices very well. So there's a number of ways you can use it. Mm -hmm. That's a part of SWAT, I think. Um, yeah, I you mean, know, if you're playing I mean, against a taller player, maybe a slice could be a very effective yeah, we shot. Yeah, we can go over to SWAT real quick on um, on premium. All right, we'll clip over um, there. And we've talked about this in uh, so SWAT analysis. We talked about this in um, you know our free strategy mini series. Gave you kind of a thirty thousand foot view, and this is the um, the block um, where we talk about all sorts of this stuff. And yeah, you can uh, you know you can use it to. Uh, 
So these video these, titles here you can see is you know, exploiting opportunities. Um, playing to your you strengths. Know, what if, and then whatever. scroll down a little bit further there. And we have all of these videos in here, which is just about playing different types of opponents. What if villain doesn't understand positioning? What if villain stands too far back? What if he has a one-handed backhand? Keep scrolling down there, uh, and let's see some of these other videos. Yeah, we actually that are... ran. That's where the end is. <laughs> <laughs> we kind of constantly, we constantly update all of this stuff. So, um, yeah, I mean, it's all about exploiting, you know, different types of opponents based on your game plan and your skill set. So, sure, um, you can use the slice to do that. Uh, if you're, you know, if you're playing a guy with, uh, with, uh, you know, who's real tall or doesn't move very well, then the slice might be uh, effective. And Federer does that a lot too. He uses yeah. the backhand slice to set up offensive situations for himself. Do you want to diagram how he does that? I mean, we've talked we a, about we have, it before, we have a video. We have a video about that. Why don't we? Why don't we answer people's questions? Okay. Um, there's, you know, we can link in one of those videos at some point. If you search Federer's inside out forehand, okay, uh, on YouTube, it'll come up. I think. Okay. The next question is also about slices from Gulliver. Uh, Lately, I seem to be having trouble with my slice backhand. I've been watching your videos, and I'd like to know, should I use a continental grip or an eastern backhand grip? The ball really bites and skids when I hit the ball correctly, but I'm a little too inconsistent. Is there a particular grip you recommend for hitting a slice backhand? Yeah, you'd want to use a continental grip. Um, the eastern backhand is a little... Uh... And the continental grip is the hammer grip, basically. Yeah, me, you want to grab get a racket. racket. We have in the on fuzzyyellowballs.com under tennis lessons up at the top. We have a, a section called grips where we. It's just a hammer that. grip. I'm holding this like I would hammer a nail into a wall. Okay. Um. So that's uh. Yeah. Heel pad, index knuckle on level. Uh. But that's the grip you uh you want to use. You've actually hit the monitor several times in in premium webcasts. I hit the monitor. I think I hit you around. maybe. Yeah. You hit me. Know. Yeah. And yeah. There, there's a reason one to of these, tune in right. Yeah. There. One of these days <laughs> I'll knock you out. I'm, I'm waiting for a good opportunity, but yeah, Gulliver with the uh, with the uh, Gulliver. By the way, we uh, we met at uh, Indian Wells, mm -hmm. um, which was cool for him just to come up and say hello to us. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the the thing with an inconsistent slice is it, it in a way it's kind of like um, um, a forehand or a backhand where people struggle with low balls or or high balls. Um, and uh, you know, you might if it's inconsistent, you probably have a contact height where you're good to go, but if it's a little bit high or a little bit low, you end up floating it. Mm -hmm. um, so the trick there is to, uh, first of all, be cognizant. Maybe you shouldn't, you know, if it's a high ball, you should hit a different type of shot. Um, and and uh, the other thing is if, if you have a little time to move, make sure you position yourself in a way where you're hitting it at the, the appropriate contact height. Okay. Um. Okay, so you want to take this question about pronation. This is a question that was emailed to us ahead of time. Um, I have a question about the serve. I'm trying to improve my pronation on my serve, and I know I need to go in the opposite direction, which is supination, to have the leading edge of the racket coming up before I strike the ball while I'm pronating. My question is, when is the best time to move into supination from the neutral position? When the racket is first behind your head, when the racket's in the racket drop position, when you're pushing off your legs some other if, time? If, yeah. Um, so... It, well, first of all, explain pronation and supination a little bit more in this context, and then, you know, do you supinate okay. while you're serving? Do you pronate? All pronation that? is basically if I point my, my hands together like this, pronation is when I turn my thumbs down towards each other. Okay. And supination would be turning the other way. Okay. So if I was serving, I would supinate like this, where my palm is now facing down, basically, and then pronate like that when okay. I come forward. So the racket twists a little further than well yeah i mean the, the than a there's there's, a, there's you know there's a variety Some, you know the pros will really supinate mm -hmm. um, when they come up and then pronate do we have that i think we have a video of frank salazar looking straight Let down me, on we, him and we, you can actually, actually see him supinate before he pronates we do um, i think this means we have to go to the dreaded rever.com oh rever um, rever is our old video provider which um, is slow we use youtube now which is unsurprisingly better yeah, so let's see if I can pull this. The, the thing I'd say while I'm looking for this video is, uh, you know, a little extra supination. It's not really, you know, the pronation is not what adds power to the serve. It's the hammering motion right? like this where, you know, my if you look at the serve, when, when I'm, uh, you know, I'll, I'll actually demo it over there. 
Yeah. Uh, why don't I do that and you can see Adam River is so slow, it's embarrassing. Hmm. Um, okay. So, yeah, the, uh, if, if, <laughs> I probably have to get down on my knees to demo this properly. If I'm in uh, the trophy pose correctly and I've gotten there, you know, per our, um, you know, FYB's explanation of how to get here where you raise the racket, palm faces down, and then you've got the racket like this. When I, uh, when I drop to the racket drop, my wrist and my racket is going to, they're going to be oriented so I can pronate properly. So the racket's going to be in the correct position if I get to the trophy pose, pro, pros, trophy pros, <laughs> the trophy pros, trophy pose properly. And whether you twist a little bit more, you know, you get the racket drop and you supinate a little bit more so you can pronate. That's one of those things I wouldn't spend too much time uh, thinking about because that's, Sort of like a minor detail that's not going to add a ton to your serve, but it might mess some stuff up, and you're kind of focusing on the wrong things. Um, so yeah, that ha let me get address that hammering motion real quick. Power on the serve when you swing up. You can see my there's an L between the racket and my forearm now. When you serve, you're going to hammer and pronate at the same time. That's what brings the strings around and the racket head up from this position. But this motion is where you get a lot of pace. Um, or power spin, you know, whatever you're looking for. But that's what uh, that's what's going to add a lot of um, juice to your serve. The pronation just brings the strings around uh, to uh, you know get you to contact properly. Okay, I pulled up. Uh, it's actually on YouTube. So this we one, have this okay. video. Um, so we'll clip over this there. one's this one. We put it in our. Uh, TV well, we'll let that player. download for a second. Um, you know. But we have a video on YouTube of Frank Salazar, who's former number one junior in the world, and it was shot with a super, super slow motion camera looking straight down on Frank at the baseline. We had a, um, I guess, the, a man lift, if you want to call it that, one of the things you'd use to fix utility electrical poles, yeah. and we put a camera out over the court yeah. and looked straight down. It was very dangerous. It was dangerous. Not All right, so lie. we fast-forwarded it. Uh, um, so... Frank is essentially around his, um, his trophy pose. You can see the racket's pointed up at the camera. But his wrist position right now and racket hitting arm is in position to swing up properly. So, so it's neutral, basically. It's neutral, right yeah. Now. You play it forward, it drops behind his head. So here's basically the racket drop. And then, you know, Frank, so you can see how the racket kind of tilts towards us a little bit. That would be a little bit of supination right, right. there. Mm -hmm. Now, Frank played on the tour. He was the number one junior in the world. Um, back in the day, and uh, you know he's not only a fantastic tennis player, like we mentioned earlier, he's the uh, 2008 United States Olympic Committee Coach of the Year. He has some of the best American juniors in the world. Mm -hmm. um, so you know now play it forward and watches his wrist now, now pronates. pronates so rewind whoops. and play that again. Right. You can watch the racket will drop down. There's a little bit of supination, and then his wrist pronates so back. Now pronates and contact. Right. So can you, now, right at contact, you can see there his wrist position, and you can see that the racket face is flat on the back of the ball. Mm -hmm. But rewind it just a little bit and play it. So, well, here, this is what I want to do. Okay. Let me, let we'll, me have we'll, the controls we'll here. Adam, uh... Okay. Here we are in the trophy pose, and we're moving in. Now I'm going to freeze it when he is in the racket drop position right there. You can see that the racket is in line with the ball. His wrist position is neutral right now in the racket drop. I'm going to play it forward, and you can see there now he's supinated ever so bit. slightly. And keep and in mind, keep in mind that supination and pronation are not just the wrist; it's the forearm it's the and the wrist forearm. turning as a piece. Right. And now, as I play this forward, he's going to pronate it. The racket's close to on edge now, and he's going to pronate it so that the face opens back up to the ball. So that's what we're talking about here between supination in the racket drop, pronation, getting the racket face flat. All, all, all this is sort of fun from an academic uh, standpoint, but yeah. you know what we try to do while, while we're happy to analyze it, um, we really try and communicate this stuff in a way where you don't need to think about, well, I supinate now <laughs> right. at this point in the swing, and then meh, pronate. Thinking about the angle uh, of your wrist during the serve is probably a surefire way to dump yeah, it so, that. So that's why I'm saying like, don't worry about the supination. If right. you follow our uh, instruction on the serve, you'll have a fundamentally sound serve. Um, and, you know, you won't, you'll be focused on the right stuff. Focusing on your supination as you swing up is a small minor detail that takes away from the macro pieces of technique.
right. that you uh, that you need to have. Okay. Um, let's take a couple questions from the chat um, that people had posted earlier. Uh, okay. The first one is from ND Tennis, and it is, how do I handle someone who just hits with slice off both sides? So forehand slices and backhand slices all the time. Mm -hmm. I tend to just slice it back, uh, which gives him an easy ball to put away, it seems. Is he putting it, that'd be, I guess, well, first of all, if you slice it back, you're probably hitting it short. Um, so first of, my first piece of, piece of advice would be uh, keep the ball deep. Um, now, the thing you got to, uh, you know, with, with slice that can be tricky is that uh, if you hit your normal groundy, um, you might actually dump it in the net. So getting a little bit higher trajectory over the net when you see that there's a slice, you need to be cognizant of that and maybe adjust uh, your swing path a little bit. Give it a little bit more loft over the net, um, and then it'll it'll drop back down, uh, back down in. Um, so that would be the uh, you know the the, the gener generic piece of advice I would I would give you with that sort of uh, seeing your uh, you know how the point is actually constructed. I mean the key if the guy's putting the ball away, you're hitting it short. If you can keep it deep, you know that's going to mitigate um, you know that particular problem. Okay. Um, let's take Mercury Rob's question. Um, in chat right now because I think it's a good one. Does it matter your grip on the serve? I guess Mercury Rob likes to use a a frying pan grip on the first serve, but then switches to a continental or, or is lately yeah, don't, switching don't to a use, continental. Don't use the frying pan, uh, the eastern you know, forehand grip. That's not going to facilitate um, a proper swing. You're, Limits you're your ability to like pronate. You're swinging all kinds well, of Well, yeah, I mean, it already has the strings oriented in the right direction, but I can't, I can't, you know, this is a more powerful motion right. than this. Right. So that's why you don't want to do um, the frying pan. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see. How do you teach a junior player footwork? I've seen your I mean, videos. Sorry, I'm, 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 I was going to make a, a comparison. You know, if you look at, <laughs> you're uh, over here swinging I, I away like swinging while I'm away. reading questions. And then I That's... looked over at the the computers, <laughs> uh, the thing playing. I was like, wow, I must look ridiculous. <laughs> Pitchers don't really throw like this. They come at, you know, they have the ball in their hand like this, right. and then they pronate when they release. Yep. So it's the same uh, same concept. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's actually take Jacob's question while we're on the serve here, uh, and then we'll move to the footwork question. I promise we'll get to that. Um, the question's about the service toss. I often hear toss straight up, straight down, but I watch the slow motion videos of the pros and it arcs in the air. So, you know, what's the deal with the serve? Does it go straight up and straight down or does it arc? Yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to arc. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I don't know. Let's if go still, back to that video of Frank. Frank. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. Uh, and the arc is different for a flat serve versus Depending a kick on, serve. Yeah. We can probably so take you, a look at that as well. Cut it back over. Let me, um, here. Yeah, so, so you're releasing, he's releasing and he's released it right about. And this is there. looking straight actually, down. That one's actually pretty straight. Um, it's moving into the it's court a little bit. It's moving into the court, and you can see that the ball is uh, slowly moving into the court there. And Frank actually does a good job of making contact. Keep in far mind, out he's into hitting he's hitting a flat serve, so there's not going to be as much uh, motion necessary here. Um, you know what we should probably do is. Um, so that one kind of arced into the court. Uh, mm -hmm. If you pull it back to us for a second, sure. I'm going to look up a kick serve um, and uh, see if we can get that a little bit more clear. Because the kick serve is going to arc over your head um, a little bit more mm -hmm. than uh, waiting for it. Hmm. The kick serve is going to arc a little bit more over your head than. Um, you know, it might have been under related videos for Frank's. Um, yeah, that's true. That's a good call. We have like a thousand videos on YouTube now, so sometimes it can actually be tricky for us to track down exactly what video we're talking about here. Um, well, hmm. whatever. It's somewhere in there. We'll find it, maybe in a minute. Um, but what's the general tip? I know you yeah, like general, to talk about placing the ball you know over what, a certain can, shoulder, maybe. I wonder if it'll come up on this. This is old school. Uh, yeah, you know, that is an old school video. Why don't we bring that in? Because that definitely shows it. Oh, yeah, I'm talking about, oh, okay, good. All right, so we can just clip over the computer screen right now. This is actually an, a video we edited where I'm, look at that goofy guy. Man, this is old school FYB right here. This is from but two years we, ago, maybe. So I think I'm about to start, huh, sweet ad. Um, so we're gonna, about to start uh, talking about, all right, so pause. All right, so my toss is going to be in different spots, even though my mechanics for releasing the ball are the same. 
and you can see how the path, first of all, this ball is obviously a huge arc. I released it, if we rewind it. I'm releasing here, and the ball is just traveling way over this way. You know, that's, it's worth pointing out that Frank and I were serving in the ad court. Right. And Frank, as a righty, is going to be tossing more into the court mm -hmm. on that end, where I'm going to be tossing over, and then it's going to be the reverse on the other, on the, on the deuce court. Mm -hmm. So that's worth pointing out. But yeah, you can see there's a big arc there. So yeah, the short sort of answer to the question is yes, there is an arc. It's not just, you know, straight up, straight down. Right. And uh, I think also what doesn't get talked about a lot necessarily is the fact that there's also that into the court component. And exactly how far you toss the ball on your serve into the court is going to help determine how aggressive you're being on your serve. Mm -hmm. The further you toss the court, the more aggressive uh, you're going to be. And I think you like to toss a little bit a little closer to the baseline than Frank does. Frank likes to go more out into the court with it. Depends, his, uh, it depends on what on what shot we're hitting. Sure. Um, you know, on a on a first serve, if I want to hit a kick serve, which was a question earlier, I'm gonna to toss the ball into the court because my body's momentum is gonna be behind it. So I can hit a high percentage first serve with, you know, some pace on it. Mm -hmm. But on a second serve I might just toss it, you know, essentially over my head and not move in as much. Um, so that kind of goes back to the question we had earlier about how to get a little extra pace on your forehand without swinging too aggressively. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, toss the, just like on the forehand where you were moving through the ball when you hit it, toss the ball into the court, so you're moving into the court and your body's momentum, you know, that'll add 10, 15 miles an hour, hour to your serve, um, ideally. All right, uh, then the next question is going to be, let's go back to the footwork one that okay. we, were, uh, we were on. Um, how do you teach a junior player footwork? I've seen your videos on footwork, but how do you actually teach someone to do it? Uh, my son has good strokes, but lousy footwork. Well, um, uh, I'll go diagram a drill you can do um, uh, if you're cognizant of all the, uh, of all the um, steps. We have uh, a special I, drill in premium. Yeah, I know. Do. That's what I was clipping over. I, you um, know, here's, here's our footwork uh, block in, um, in FYB premium. And... Um, I believe it is under split and step out because we call it the Matryoshka drill. So I'm just kind of scrolling down through um, through all the videos in this section. But it's called the Matryoshka drill, um, which is kind of an evolving drill that, that gets more, it's something we came up with. It gets more and more complicated uh, the more sophisticated your uh And it's your purely footwork. a footwork drill. Yeah, yeah, it's only a footwork drill. Uh, a drill you can do uh, just to and that drill sort of forces you to execute the correct footwork, no yeah, matter what it, direction it, it, you're yeah, moving. Yeah, exactly. It teaches you how to move in every single direction, um, you know, like the pros are moving. Uh, you know, a drill you can uh, you can do with your son is is a uh, dead ball drill, which means you're feeding. So, um, what was what was this uh, gentleman's name? Uh, I think I missed it. Uh, I, I, Caleb. Oh, okay, I'm going to say Caleb. I could so be pronouncing that totally Caleb, wrong. I'm going to put you right here. Um, and I was a minor, I was an art minor in school, as you can tell. So this is you and your basket of balls. Um, and we're going to put your, uh, well, use blue. We'll put your son uh, up here. It's a tennis racket. Um, and... <laughs> <laughs> This is quality. I stuff. can't watch this train wreck. Um, and basically, this dead ball drill. This is this is a drill. We we spoke with Col uh, Col. I'm having problems with the English language today. Uh, <laughs> Paul Goldstein uh, talked about this drill in a recent interview we did with him um, that we linked to is on the Thanks USA blog, uh, and um, you can you know it's it's in one of our old newsletters. But basically, what he said: dead ball drill. You're here. Your son would be here, and you're just going to toss tennis balls to a particular location and this drill very simple literally Caleb if I'm you I'm just here tossing you know at, in this point you know in, with this particular focus of the drill trying to get your son to move not really worrying about where the but this simple drill allows you to isolate something like the footwork you could isolate your you know backswing if you wanted to or your contact point but you know what you what you could do is Put a cone back here. I think that Farno says that the kid looks very happy with his balloon. His so. balloon? <laughs> <laughs> I have no comeback to that. <laughs> Good one. All right, so let me refocus. All right, so maybe you'd have a cone there, and then, um, you know, the goal would be 
to move out to the ball with proper footwork technique. And if you're cognizant of what that technique is, you'll be able to see if that's being executed. Hit and then recover back and then move out to the next ball and then recover back and so on. So what you're doing here, I mean, who cares where the ball goes? You're isolating simply the footwork with this very basic drill. Basic, but it's good because it gives you control of you know, where you're feeding it and it's just, it allows you again uh, to really drill down a particular point of technique. In this instance, footwork. Um, so, uh, so uh, Grut, um, you know, I might make some instructional videos on how to, uh, how to draw um, because I, I spent years perfecting that technique. So, mm -hmm. um, all right. Well, let's take. We'll uh, see if I get any more requests for that. Let's take uh, the next question from from Tomothy, uh in chat. With it, he asked earlier, which is, uh, this goes back to SWAT. How do you play or handle players who hit flat and fast with a ton of pace? Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I, I guess he's having some trouble dealing with that. They don't give him enough time to do anything with the ball. Okay, where's who? Where's just highlight it. That was this question. Here. Okay. Uh, hit flat with a lot of pace. Um, well, there's a couple things. First of all, if you know, this goes back to the the. Uh, uh, <laughs> I'm reading a comment. EPAP says, um, if uh, if we go back to that question of when should you use the slice? Is it just defensive? Mm -hmm. Well, a slice can be a good way to combat a guy who hits really hard and flat. If you get the ball low in the strike zone, and your opponent has to hit it, you know, up to get it over the net, but then have it still drop into the court. If he's hitting really flat that ball's probably going to sail. Mm -hmm. So he's going to either have to take something off the ball or uh, put a little bit more topspin on it. If you have a windshield wiper forehand, that's something you can use it for because that'll get the ball up and down. Mm -hmm. um, but that would be an obvious way to, uh, to combat the, uh, the uh, flatter hitters. If you um, watch the pro tour, something Rafa does uh, against Soderling, who, who crushes the ball, is he moves the guy. Don't let him set up. Um, Keep them, uh, you know, keep them uh, moving, you know, obviously in a high percentage way, um, so that they uh, they can't really set up and take big cuts at the ball. Mm -hmm. um, from a technical standpoint, uh, you might want to shorten your backswing a little bit, um, give yourself a little bit more time. You can stand back; that doesn't always work. Um, if you stand back, you're also giving your opponent a little bit more time to right. set up. So that's a consideration you need to take into account. But the trick is basically, um, you've got a number of options at your disposal. And you want to, you know, over the course of the match, if you don't know your opponent too well, test them out and see what works exactly. Yep. Um, I would also suggest, uh, you know, double check and do an honest assessment of your footwork because you may not be split stepping uh, when your opponent yeah, hits you the ball. Yeah, that's a very good point. If you're that's not split point. stepping, you're going to be slow to the ball, that's and it's certainly going to seem like your opponent is giving you a lot less time. Um, so, you know, are you moving well to the ball? Are you tired? You know, is that one of the reasons why you're having trouble getting to the ball? That's, that's certainly a, that's a fantastic are you stepping? point. Yep. Because every single amateur that we go out and film, uh, you know, in premium we have this whole section of amateur players, uh, you know, that have allowed us to film them. Like, none of them split step correctly every single time. Yeah, the timing's off, or the, the, the proper footwork is like the quickest way to playing tennis well. Right. I mean, it's incredible. If you can move well, you're good. Um, so let's take two questions from chat. Okay. Um, and the first one, which was up here. Let me find that again. Um, okay. Mercury Rob's question first, okay. since he asked it first. What's the best way to take this stuff to the court with you? So, you know, in other words, how do you remember this stuff when you're on the court, when you're practicing it, or during a match? Well, for right now, I would say a uh, uh, note card. But um, for all you, uh, for all you iPod, your handy dandy note card that you have on all these card. strategy this is, videos. This is my analog. This is the analog <laughs> uh, option um, for all you iPod owners. Um, uh, in FYB Premium, every single video. You can just download to uh, download your iPod. There's Every single video in there, there's a button that just says "Download to iPod." Download to iPod. Bam! Take so, it with you to the court. <laughs> I mean, now it's you know there it goes. So that's going fast. Well, we got it. You know, it's, I guess I, I should probably cancel this. Considering, uh, <laughs> yeah, since we're doing a webcast right now <laughs> and you're downloading something, but you can download every single video, put it on your iPod, um, and then just take it to court. Yeah. Because um, obviously, yeah, you, there's sometimes some of these videos, a lot of these videos, particularly the DNO section. 
they're has complicated. Some 30, well, they're complicated, right. but they're also like 30 minutes long, some of them. Right. Uh, so there's a lot to, you know, you need a lot of note cards to get 30 minutes worth of uh, <laughs> uh, content on there. Right. Um, and the next question was um, from Dan662. He says, how do I change direction of the ball more effectively? When I try to change direction, I usually hit it out very wide. Um, sorry, say that to me one more time. How do you change direction of the ball more effectively? Uh, because when he's trying to change direction, he ends up hitting it out. Yeah, I mean, this, this well, are you talking about inside or uh, outside ground strokes? I mean, first of right. all, I would identify um, what... Uh, Dan, have you seen, post in chat right now, Dan, have you watched our strategy mini-series videos uh, leading up to this? Uh, and have you seen the inside and outside ground strokes video? Yeah, I mean, that would be, that would be the, the, the first question I would ask. I mean, if you're, if you're going for low percentage uh, change of directions, um, then that's going to, uh, you know, lead to lead to some mistakes. Um, it's, it's a small, it's a small, um, where is it? So the first thing that you were saying though was essentially that it's not necessarily, it might not be your technique, it might be when you're trying to change direction that is actually causing you problems. Yeah, you're exactly. You're trying to change direction on the wrong shots. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And exactly. he says he has not yet seen the directionals video. Okay, um, so that would be my first, I mean, watch that because that tells you, you know, inside, outside ground strokes, some are higher percentage uh, than others. Yeah, I'll, let me, since Dan says that he has not seen this, there may be some other people watching right now. Um, over the last week, basically, we have done a mini-series on mm -hmm. strategy. Uh, we've released four videos, and the series is about an hour long, and all we do is talk about strategy. These are free videos, uh, and they're further down the page. So after this webcast, if you want to go uh, watch those, they're called Strategy Mini-Series Part 1 through 4. Um, they give you a, basically a 30,000 foot view of how we talk about strategy inside of premium. So one of the things, the very first thing actually that we talk about in that strategy mini-series is changing direction of the ball. Mm -hmm. When should you do it and why should you do it uh, yep. and how. Mm -hmm. So I think, Dan, your question might be addressed in there. Uh, I encourage all you that guys be... watching to go watch that mini-series because it's a, it's a ton of great content. Yeah. Um, the other the other sort of quick thing I would say right now is is you know cross court versus down the line is slight adjustments in timing. You might hit the ball for down the line a little bit later than you would for a cross court ball. Um, but uh, you know that's uh, we can have that discussion <laughs> some other time. Uh, so that's better video supported. Uh, win three twenty. I think I'm pronouncing that properly. Mm -hmm. Win three twenty uh, in chat. Um, says, when I try to change direction on inside ground strokes, it tends to go out. Even when I go for the higher percentage shot cross court, uh, I tend to miss it. Um, I would need a little bit uh, more information to know specifically when, what you're doing wrong. It could be a technique thing. Oh, exactly. It could be a technique thing. Um, you know, my, my initial piece of advice would, uh, would if you're going to go for a higher percentage shot, put a little more topspin on it. Hit, hit with a windshield wiper technique. And he's missing it long as well. He's missing it. Well, the then, then mm -hmm. I'd put more topspin on it. Um, that would be the most obvious uh, solution. Pull it into the court. So if you have a windshield wiper forehand, um, that, would be, uh, that would be my recommendation. Um, but you have to have a classic, fundamentally sound forehand first before you can you can build a, a windshield wiper. You actually missed a question about Rafa's forehand. Above. Let's go Wynn's last question here. It, okay. it could be that he's jamming up actually, because that's, it's that's, coming into that's, it. Oh, an inside ground stroke? Mm -hmm. um, that's a good, uh, a, a good point because, you know, in, if the ball is kind of, you know, if you're in a cross-court rally and the ball comes to you as an inside ground stroke, um, but you have to take a couple steps, mm -hmm. then there's a technique required for... Um, for setting yourself properly, particularly turning outside ground strokes into inside ground strokes. That's a section uh, in premium we call manufacturing offensive situations, which teaches you how to take low percentage shots and turn them into high percentage shots. A lot of it has to do with your footwork. Um, you know, that's, uh, that's the uh, sort of the key. You know, the reason Federer is such a good offensive player, he has a sweet forehand, but it's his feet. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why, you know, he was struggling with his movement a little bit against Burditch. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why his forehand was a little errant. It's all about how you move. Um, so we, that's one of the things we focus on, uh, block seven, manufacturing offensive situation. Um, but, uh, you know, that, you know, like, like we said earlier, I mean, the key to good tennis is footwork. Mm -hmm. just, and it's know. amazingly important. Uh, being able to set up properly, being able to hit on balance yeah. is so key to executing your shots effectively. 
uh, and we spend a whole block inside yeah. a premium combining footwork and strokes. Yeah, and then we come back to it in manufacturing uh, yep. offensive situations. But but when if you're jammed, that yeah, that almost definitely sounds like a footwork issue to me. Yeah, because you're just letting the ball get too close to you. Mm -hmm. Or a ball judgment issue, that too, yeah, possibly. Yeah, could be ball judgment. Uh, if you scroll up, I think it's question six on the, uh, the document over there. Uh, question number six. Let's jump back to that from Nick. Okay. Um, well, I'm not sure exactly what the uh, question is. No, 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 no. It's, um, oh, whoops. I, uh, it's a question about... Sorry, I deleted the first part. The beginning of the <laughs> you question. You deleted the actual question. <laughs> Why didn't you ask it? Um, <laughs> the beginning of the question was, I, I'm at, he's, he's at Wimbledon, and he says, Rafa's trajectory on when he's at Wimbledon, uh, the, his forehand's over the net, much lower than the French Open when he had more trajectory on the ball. Um, yet he's still hitting with a windshield wiper forehand. So then you can pick up. That mm -hmm. should be the lead-in for the rest of the... Uh, Okay, um, so he's hitting through the ball with a flatter swing, imparting a lot less spin on the ball than on clay, uh, yet still does a windshield wiper forehand technique as opposed to the traditional follow-through. Yeah. Um, and our instructional videos show a high net clearance on the windshield wiper forehand. So Rafa definitely has a low net clearance on grass. Uh, so, you know, how does this, how does that change depending on what surface you're playing on? Yeah, I mean, you can hit, you know, this... And this also goes back to our discussion earlier, the classic forehand, the windshield wiper, the reverse. It's not like those are three separate entities and there's no blurring of the line in between them. You, the goal uh, with your forehand or with any shot is to be able to control your swing path so that, you know, in, in our video, mm -hmm. uh, my, the windshield wipers I was hitting in the, in the free site, there was a decent amount of net clearance because the point of that video was to show you how this is a high percentage shot that right. you can still use as, you know, an offensive weapon, but mm -hmm. you can certainly lower your trajectory over the net, flatten it out, but still have topspin on the ball. Okay. Um, we've got a clip of Rafa here. I'll pull that up. Hitting forehands, and Rafa just generally has a relatively vertical swing path. He gets the racket down low, and there's and <laughs> well, it's chopped over the chopped entire swing there. We went through. Lovely. Go to the next forehand. He he. Rafa does a lot of crazy stuff, like pronating to add a lot of uh, right. extra juice to his. Um, and these videos are on YouTube. This is yeah, Rafa this is hitting YouTube. in slow motion at Indian Wells. So you can compare Rafa's uh, technique where he, you know, has a pretty low to high swing. Let me see if I can pull up uh, a Federer forehand uh, from Indian Wells. Uh, this should be good. Let me see. I, I kind of distinctly remember doing this when he hit all backhands for... He did. He, hit, he hits backhands for a while on right, this clip and then... All right, so Federer, this might... This no, you're is probably going to have to replay it because we're getting some pretty serious chops. It doesn't matter. That ball network. was too low for the one. I, uh, okay. I'm trying to find a higher ball in his contact. Yeah. Um, so on a higher ball, this looks like he's going to be a high ball. Well, nope, I take it back. <laughs> the point I'm trying to get at is that these guys are going to vary their swing path. That's going to be a low this ball. This is a low ball. So see, you know, you notice on that one, I'm going to play really that vertical. again. I'm going to play that again. First of all, yeah, uh, if we freeze it here, his hand is real low, and then he's going to have a relatively vertical, you know, come straight up. So his hand got real low ball, below the ball there. Um, and then, all right, good, that's the one I wanted. So here, hand not nearly as low. It's above his pant line, and the other one was there. So Federer has, you know, he's coming way through the ball here, way much more through the ball. Flatter swing path. You'll notice it's still a windshield wiper forehand. Racket still turns over. You can see through the string, strings. Um, so he's varying his swing path. Uh, Rafa's varying his swing path. So Rafa's made a slight adjustment. Um, he's kind of just goofing around. On that, <laughs> that was a shank there. Oh, whoops, never mind. All right, that's whatever. Anyway, the point here is that you can hit a windshield wiper with you know X swing path that might be a little bit more horizontal. Y that's that's I just did. <laughs> vertical when I said horizontal. X, uh, Y, it's algebra, you it's can, math, it you doesn't can, Yeah, you can, <laughs> it's too complicated. You can hit a windshield wiper forehand with a vertical swing path, very vertical, you can do it with a more horizontal swing path. And Rafa has a lower trajectory, he's hitting harder because the ball is gonna move through grass quicker. He's made an adjustment based on the surface. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we've gotten through all the questions that were emailed to us ahead of time. Okay. I think we've answered a ton of questions in chat. Um, yeah. We wanna wrap it up here? 
Yeah, I mean, I think we we've should. About an hour I, think, and a half I now. think we've given you guys a pretty clear. Well, first of all, you know, hopefully you guys got something, uh, you know, useful out of this stuff you can apply uh, when you hit the court. Why don't we? Why don't we go ahead and take uh, take one more question? If somebody fires one out uh, in the chat that looks um, looks uh, enticing, I guess. <laughs> now we're getting like Murray and you know comments sure. about the Pro Tour. Sure. Um, you know, um, well, you know what? I uh, doesn't look like anybody is. Yeah, why don't we just? Anything. So we're gonna we're here. gonna we're gonna go uh, we're gonna go ahead. Um, why don't you ask me that? Tim asked a question about British. Uh, How to copy his, British serve. serve? You know, we can talk about him in the uh, in the. Um, actually, that, that's, that, that, that's actually that's when, when actually um, yeah, but this is actually a perfect uh, point to make right now, and then we'll we'll wrap up on that question. Um, um, from Tim. He's, he's saying, how do I copy uh, British to serve? And I, Tim, I'm not going to specifically answer that question. What I am going to say is that when you watch the pros, um, there's and, and we pointed this out in our free email course on the forehand, mm -hmm. the thing to look for is not the particular idiosyncrasies right. from pro to pro. You want to see what all these guys are doing the same. So, Tim, if you were going to look at British to serve and copy the motion to a T. If you were able to copy his entire motion, that would be cool because in that process, even though you've copied idiosyncrasies, you've also taken the fundamentals of the right. serve too. Now, mm -hmm. Burditch has all the fundamentals. Feder has all the fundamentals. Rafa has all the fundamentals. Their motions look very different. Rock, right. sure. abbreviated motion. I mean, yeah. All these motions are very uh, unique because the, the fundamentals have been surrounded by these idiosyncrasies that make them look different. Right. So the trick, and what we got to be careful with is we see a guy that we, you know, that's my favorite pro. <laughs> yeah. uh, I'm going to copy his technique. And what ends up happening is you don't develop the fundamentals, but you do develop. You Gonzalez's see a lot of like, yeah, you see a lot of, I was going to say, you see a ton of juniors especially try to copy that huge backswing of Gonzalez. They love that. It's it's showy and it makes them feel like they're hitting harder. But it, the reality is you got to have those fundamentals. Yeah, you ha and that's, that's the problem with copying a pro. If you can do it correctly and you're cognizant of what these fundamentals are, then you're, then you're cool. Then that, right. that's fine. But in my experience as a coach, when people try and do that, it ends up messing up their motion because... Yeah, um, I mean, keep in mind that not a single one of these pros who has all the fundamentals, you know, in other words, Gonzalez did not say to himself, I'm going to copy Gonzo's backswing. Yeah, <laughs> it developed it de for yeah, him exactly. because he had the fundamentals uh -huh. and then his own style, what was comfortable for him, develops off of that. Exactly. He, he's now developed a style, idiosyncrasies, that complement his athletic talents. Right. Um, so that would be, um, you know, that's my answer to the should I copy Burditch. Um, to round this out, I'm going to answer uh, Status X's question, which was, who is a good model to copy? Um, and this is a little bit of a cop-out. Uh, I would say Roger Federer for the serve, very smooth classic, classic motion. motion. Mm -hmm. Forehand two, compact backswing, mm -hmm. um, very clean mechanics. Um, is a good I like one. Safin. There's not too much flashy going on there, and he hits... Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, Saffin's got a good forehand. I, I, I think, uh, you know, Federer, Federer really Certainly is Saffin's amazing. backhand. Federer's one-handed backhand. Uh, Saffin's got a good backhand. Djokovic has a good backhand. Mm -hmm. Agassi. I mean, if you want to talk about, Agassi actually might be the guy. Not counting, you know, his serve, too, actually is pretty, you know, pretty clean. Agassi's a great model because his technique is very simple. He has more linear, uh, more horizontal swing paths that are, that are more effective uh, for learning and can be effective at the rec level. Yeah. Are very effective. So Agassi is a good guy. Um, um, I would uh, I would look at. Um, so yeah, with that in mind, guys. Um, so I think we've you know this webcast went about an hour and a half, and yeah. you guys got a chance to answer you know to ask a ton of questions. Hopefully, we've answered you know all the questions that you wanted answered or that we could answer. Um, and this should give you a pretty good idea of exactly what the webcast is inside of Premium each week. Uh, you know that's what we were going for. So if you have any other questions, you know, about what exactly we do inside of Premium, feel free to ask us those. Send us an email. Um, yeah, and questions hopefully, and, or subscriptions at right. fuzzyyellowballs.com is probably the best, um, the best option there. But we do something like this, like we said, every single... Uh, every week we answer every question that comes into us. Uh, actually, and, and to close, I'll answer one final question. Um, 
Do you guys have one-handed backhands or two-handed backhands? I have a two-handed backhand. Adam I don't doesn't. have a backhand. All right, that's all right. You read my <laughs> I mind. Even, I don't even have a backhand. Ah, you read I my run, mind. I run yeah. all the way around all with my All four hands. Yep. If you can actually get it to his backhand, he just concedes the point. Yeah. No, it's, uh, uh, it's it impressive. doesn't happen, though. Yeah. <laughs> it does. Just Quick true. feet. He's so Quick fast. Feet. His footwork's so good, he gets around everything. All four hands. All right, guys. Well, I hope um, I hope you guys really enjoyed this and you got a lot of value out of it. Yep. Um, so, again, feel free to... Uh, um, send us some questions, and yes, this is actually how we're going to close it out. <laughs> Farno, yes, Adam is actually that bad. Um, thanks, guys. Cut to commercial. All right. Bye, <laughs> guys. See you later.